Well, Jessica, thanks so much for being here with us. Really Happy appreciate you coming out. For people who don't know who you are, how would you describe yourself? Who are you? Okay, so I am a letterer, illustrator, graphic designer, which I don't do that much graphic design anymore, but that's the term that most people understand. So on forms, I always write graphic designer. Um, and secret web designer. And the reason why I say secret web designer is because I don't do anything for clients and I don't tell anyone actively that I have the skills to be able to do HTML and CSS, but I have them um, just because they help me do my own side project stuff. So lettering um, is like a very weird mix of graphic design and illustration. It's like illustrations of words. So it's far more on the illustration side than it is the graphic design side, even though like designers kind of want to have it as theirs because they think of typography as being in their realm. But yeah, so I work for a big variety of clients. I do a lot of stuff for book covers. I do a lot of stuff for um, advertising. And then the most notable recent stuff that I've probably done is the titles for Wes Anderson's most recent movie. And I also am a part of a big uh, series of classic books that Penguin's releasing now uh, called Penguin Drop Caps, which will be 26 books all featuring I, I there. just saw those. I saw, you know, the Dracula and like, ugh. Oh no, those are the ones for Barnes and Noble even. Oh, so there's a okay. new set. So, so, so I did, did a, yeah, yeah. I did a series for Barnes and Noble that were really fun. Um, and they were the full titles and like very illustrative and, and lettering all over the, all over them. And they were leather bound with two color foil. Mm -hmm. But these are through Penguin. And so Penguin actually, uh, Paul Buckley, when he saw my drop caps that, my, that I made for my daily drop cap project, um, which started in 2009, he was like, we got to figure out a way how to do something with these. And it took him like a year, year and a half to get them to like really get on board with the idea of it. So now I'm doing a new series of classic re-releases and they're all based on the author's last name and we're going through the full alphabet. So it starts with Austin Bronte, you know, and, and every um, book, the main cover art is a giant letter that's on the front that oh, I wow. draw based on the story. That's amazing. So everyone kind of knows what it means to be a graphic designer. And you answered this a little bit already, but what does it mean to be a letterer? Is that strictly fonts or is that hand drawing fonts or what does that mean? The, I love when this topic gets brought up just because a lot of people sort of don't understand the difference between fonts and lettering and calligraphy. So they're all very different fields. They, they're very different to me as a nerd because all the nerds are very like, oh my God, can you believe how crazy different it is? But, you know, to common people, it's all the same umbrella. But um, type design and making fonts is a lot more involved um, in terms of making systems um, than the kind of work that I do for clients, which is lettering work. So if you think about it, it's like being, um, like if I'm going to put it in web terms or anything too, it's like, it's like being a a designer, like being a letter is more like being a designer for like the, the main focus of the site and being a type designer is the person that has to develop the full backend system for everything to work in. So uh, type designers, of course, there's a lot of artistry that goes into what they do and they are crafting all the letter forms from scratch. But unlike what I do as a letterer, all of the letter forms have to work together in endless combinations and being put together by people that do not know what they're doing in design software. So you have to idiot proof it a thousand percent. You have to technology proof it like crazy. Like there are typefaces that were digitized 15 years ago that still work on your computer now. And not many people understand like that's why typefaces cost what they do. Because when was the last time you bought software that lasted for 15 years? You know, you really have to future-proof it, and it's very, very involved. And lettering is is very different because it's more like if if type designers are like architects or engineers, then letterers are like, you know, people that make beautiful handcrafted boxes or something. It's not meant to be reproduced. It's not actually meant to be perfect. It's just meant to like be very human and and you know be made for a very specific situation. So if I'm doing lettering for a book cover that lettering's never meant to be used anywhere else. You know, I'm drawing it specifically for that instance. So when people write me and say, hey, do you have the T to that alphabet? And I'm like, nope, I only drew that <laughs> one word. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people don't understand the, the reason why you would do lettering when there are so many typefaces out there. And the main thing, and this is like shocking, but sometimes you can't find a typeface that'll really work for what you need. Um, for instance, with the, with the titles that I did for Moonrise Kingdom, they really wanted to use a script 
but there's very few typefaces that come in optical weights. And so optical weights are different than normal weight of a typeface, like a bold or regular and light, which are meant to be like, you know, a very different version of the typeface. Optical weights are meant so that you can scale the typeface to a different size and it looks like it's the same weight to the tiny size. So you have to make all these little subtle changes between them in order to make them look like they're the same weight. You know, there are a lot of really great instances where letters come into play and one of them is for book covers and stuff like that. So if you had a book cover and you had a four letter title, a 15 word subtitle and the author's name and you wanted them all to be set in the same typeface, it's gonna be really hard for you to find a typeface that isn't like a workhorse text face where you can use, use it at all those sizes that you need. So that's where a letterer would come into play. Like we could draw everything from scratch exactly as you want it. So you end up with ultimately like precisely what you would want versus almost what you want. Oh, that's that's amazing. You're you're educating me here. Uh, so <laughs> let's let's probably back up and start from the beginning. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, which is in Northeast PA. We are a wonderful part of the nation, full of scandal. Also home to Joe Biden, though he is from two towns better than my town in terms of malls. So we used to drive <laughs> 40 miles as teenagers to go to the mall in Scranton instead of going to ours. But um, yeah, it wasn't, it's, it's funny because there's a good amount of designers that have come out of that area. Um, and I, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it is a, like a small town. So the people that, you know, got really artistic got to bond together and we did have like a pretty good art program in our high school, all things considered. So um, thanks to the public school, which I transferred into to take more art classes, I was able to sort of leave town and make it into real art school. So where did you go to school? I went to school at Tyler School of Art, which is part of Temple University. It's there. Uh, Temple has the, you know, all the separate schools, just like how Wharton is at Penn. Um, and But I got a BFA from that program, so there's a BA and a BFA, so I was a BFA student. Okay, so when did you first realize that uh, you wanted to be a designer? Was it, you know, long before that, or did you just kind of have to pick something going into college, or? Well, I, I lucked into a school that had an excellent design program, but I had no intention of being a designer when I applied to art school. Really? What yeah. did you want to do? I just knew I wanted to make art in some way, shape, or form. Like, it was the only thing that I loved to do and was passionate about. Um, I also loved to write when I was in high school, but I didn't really feel like I wanted to be a novelist, or, and I didn't feel like I wanted to be a journalist. And um, the art was something that, like, just ever since I could walk, you know, I was drawing, and it, it was just my whole life. Um, so... I, start, I went to school to be kind of like a painting drawing major because I didn't know what graphic design was at all. And it wasn't until I got to school that I was able to sort of take a design class and really, you know, have the light bulb go off of like, wow, this is actually what I should be doing for a living. And not because it's the practical thing, but because it's the thing that I most easily acclimated to. I didn't feel like at 19 I like wanted to make paintings about my feelings, you know. I, I was very happy to be able to express on the behalf of others instead of, you know, having to be very self-expressionistic. So um, design was really awesome for that because I got to solve problems. I got, you know, a brief that I had to attack like a crossword puzzle and figure out how to visually solve it. So it was really eye-opening. So what, what you went to school for was very directly related to what you do now. Which exactly. Isn't, which isn't always the case. Yeah, but what's really amazing is that I went to school to draw and be an image maker, essentially. And then I found my way into graphic design. And most graphic designers aren't image makers. You know, they're more curators. They're, they're taking this content and manipulating things around the content to make it really sing. So, you know, they find the right image, or they find the right images, they find the right typefaces, and then they put it all together in a really awesome layout. But they're not often make like the creators of the images or the creators of the photographs or the creators of the typefaces. So I went through the graphic design program and sort of found my way into lettering uh, a couple years later, which gets me far closer to my original goal, which was to make images for a living. So, Do you feel like the transition from college to career was a, a natural one or were you kind of like unemployed for a while or did you have an internship? Like what's your story there? It was pretty smooth for me, and I think that's just because when I was in college, I did intern a lot. So I interned first at a publisher, Quirk Books, 
um, and they're in Philadelphia, and they do like sort of like funny gifty books. The the probably the most recent thing that they've done that is widespread is the Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies stuff. Like so, they're the ones that originally put out those books, at least I believe so. And then um, I had discovered well, I knew of the work, but also fell in love with the work of these dudes at Headcase Design who were also in Philly and also taught at my school while I was interning at Quirk because they published the books that they had put out which are very illustrative and and really funny and they're doing a lot of authoring of the content. And so I ended up interning for Headcase Design after having one of them as a professor and I was their first intern. It was just two dudes and then I was their first intern. And um, I freelanced for them after I graduated because they were just too busy. So they were like, we have all these books we got to work on. Like, you know, are you around? Can you help out? And I ended up being a full-time freelancer for them for six months and loved it. And then they cut my hours because they weren't sure if they wanted another to hire a third employee because that was obviously a big step for the business to do that. Mm -hmm. So when they cut my hours, I tried to push myself out there as an illustrator more and sent out promos. And that's when I got hired by Louise Feely in New York and just had to completely uproot and change my plans and, and move to New York in three weeks. Was it, so was it a big decision for you to strike out on your own? I mean, was that kind of nerve wracking for you or were you just? Like, it was a big yeah. decision and it was something that I knew that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I had everything in line to make it not nerve wracking. Like, I think one thing that's really important that not a lot of people consider when they are thinking about going full-time freelance is that to have enough money in the bank. Just because sure. I, I thankfully did because I was freelancing like crazy while I worked for Louise. I would you know, work for her from 9 to 6 and then go home and work from 7 until 1 or 2 in the morning every day and then work at least one day on the weekends. And this went on for almost three years. So... I was working nonstop. I had plenty of money saved, but a big thing that a lot of people do when they want to go freelance is they branch out thinking that whatever they're doing now will pay the bills, but whatever you're doing pays the bills six months from now. It doesn't pay the bills now. So um, having that reserve made it less nerve wracking, but it was still really scary to sure. go from like complete order to, to no order whatsoever. Was there one particular project that you feel like just really launched your career or... Was Definitely. It, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, well, I felt like my career was going really well. I was doing more editorial illustration, hardly any lettering at the time. Um, I was doing a lot of lettering for Louise, for Louise during my day job, but um, not doing quite as much lettering for freelance stuff. But when I quit working for Louise, I um, started my daily drop cap project, which was a project that I made so that I could do lettering every day after I left working for Louise. So I gave myself a goal that I was going to draw a letter a day every day, well, every work day, until I made it through 12 alphabets. So I would just go, you know, alphabetically through 12 times until I made it all the way through. And it was just a way for me to be able to give myself a really, like, a longer-term project that wasn't as intimidating because I was doing it in these little chunks, but that also allowed me to do lettering every day and really get more lettering work into my portfolio. So it was because of that project that my career just completely went crazy because I had been getting consistent work. It was like I was going to all the illustration events and I had this posse of illustration friends in New York that were all really awesome and, you know, very motivating because they all had great careers and really pushed me to, to go further. But when I launched Daily Drop Cap and when it started really getting into the design blogs and making the rounds, that's when people started to kind of recognize my name more. And I was less of like, oh, you know, another illustrator that does cut papery kind of vector illustration. And, and people really saw me for the stuff that I really wanted to do, which was the lettering work. And I started to get more and more lettering work because of that project. That's, you know, that's really fascinating because... I'm actually doing the same thing myself right now, but with numbers. Oh, yeah? I, I just, sometimes I just get an itch to design stuff, and I was like, you know what? If I just go with numbers, I'll never run out of them. Nice. You know? But so, in a way, you'll never run out of them. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's, that's very cool. What's your process for developing a lettering project? Um, from like a design perspective, but also a technical perspective? Sure, sure. Well, depending on the kind of client that I'm working for, um, the process changes a little bit. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, most of my lettering work takes place in Adobe Illustrator. That's like my prime time program. Okay. 
And um, I draw everything with the pen tool. I don't use a lot of crazy fancy tricks and stuff because if you can master the pen tool in Illustrator, you've essentially mastered Illustrator. Like that is, it is the base. It's like the bread and butter of that program. Um, and I mostly use a mouse. I have a Cintiq that I bought that I thought I was gonna be like completely in love with and I do love it, but I love it for doing sketches and not for working in vector as much just because I am so much faster with the mouse because of all the practice that I've had with it. But in general, when I work for, for clients, um, you know, I'll get the brief from the client, we'll figure out how many sketches that they need up front and what level of sketches that they need. In general, something like a logo, which the end client would be just kind of a normal person and, and less someone in the designer field, it, things would need to look a little more finished up front. Whereas if it was something for advertising, I can work a lot more you know, with the team at the ad agency and present pencil sketches first and then get them to approve one of the pencil sketches and then we do a, you know, a rough and then maybe at that stage they can show the client. I generally start with pencils or with drawings of my Cintiq that I just do in, in Photoshop and then um, send that off, do three or four, get approval for one and then jump into Illustrator. I don't often trace my sketches because I think that uh, there's a lot that happens in the translation between sketch and final if I, don't if I don't trace them. Whereas if I do trace them, I'm like a little too loyal to the sketch and maybe the sketch wasn't as perfect as I'd like it to be. That's interesting. For me, it's kind of like if I don't trace the sketch, it's like I get to draw from life. It's like going to a figure drawing class. Sure. You know, because your mind like reinterprets what you want and it idealizes things and you can, you know, really let the tools that you're working with help you instead of having to be very mechanical when you're doing your pencil drawing. And then, so I work in Illustrator and in general, if, if people need the layered files or they need the AI files, I can give them to them. But a lot of times they can be really complex mm -hmm. uh, depending on what kind of work it is. If it's illustrative lettering work, sometimes it gets so crazy that it won't preview anymore in Illustrator. So I have to export everything as TIFFs and send them the, the flattened artwork just because it's, you know, you wouldn't think that something that's math based on vector would get so crazy. But once you start adding all kinds of blurs and stuff, it gets a little bonkers. As a designer, I feel like I only have an intuition when picking fonts. You know, I'll, I'll approach a project and I'll need to have letters someplace and I'll just kind of, you know, scroll through and look through different fonts. And how do you uh, figure out how to take a message from a client and then turn that into letters? Well, if you're talking about picking typefaces, that's like a totally different process than doing lettering stuff. Which I understand now. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> and picking typefaces, I think trusting your intuition isn't a terrible way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, but a big thing that you have to consider when you're choosing typefaces too are like, what is the use of this typeface? Mm -hmm. So, and for me, a, a big part of choosing typefaces is figuring out what content is the most important or the most prevalent throughout what the client needs. So if it's a single page po like or a poster, it's very different than an annual report. Right. So for an annual report, you definitely want to pick your text type first because it's going to be the most prevalent thing there. Whereas if it's a, like a crazy poster or something where that's going to be single use, big display, you know, fine, pick your display first and then pick a text type that matches and still goes with everything. But you really have to think about what needs that you have of the typeface. Like, you know, if you're working for a client that's international, they might need a typeface that has a lot of the, you know, has a non-Latin component to it. Like mm -hmm. maybe you need the Greek version of the typeface or sure. you need to find something that has an Arabic that matches it well. And that's like a whole other ballpark of, of typeface choosing. Um, but really, you can, you, can, you can get pretty nerdy about it. It kind of depends on what you want to like what your priorities are. If you, you can totally trust your intuition because typefaces do have personality, they have feeling. Like you look at something and you can tell if it makes you feel warm and fuzzy or if it makes you feel like austere and you know, right. like being very, I don't know, German Elegant, or maybe. something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Sure. So like you can, you can completely trust that, but if you feel like going like the next level, you can investigate the history of typefaces and say you're working on something that's meant to be like alluding to the 1930s or something. You know, you can choose a typeface that was designed by someone that was, you know, that had designed it around then and was maybe re redrawn recently by some crazy person. And then, you know, clients love to hear stuff like that where you can give 
give them these kind of facts to you know, re-say to their friends at parties because we're, tell them we, story, all, yeah. we love to tell stories and we love to be nerds and we love to like have these like secret facts about the things that we've made that no one else knows about but it's like a secret Easter egg for like us and for people that would care to know. So I think that you can get, you can get really fun when you choose typefaces but I think that it's not wrong to choose based on intuition for sure. That's really cool. So one thing that really impresses me about your work is just your work ethic. I mean, I feel like you just kind of never stop working. Have yeah, you, I, so that's the case, or it's like both a problem and great. <laughs> I I make jokes all the time about how I'm like a terrible relaxer. When we, I just got married recently, and going on my honeymoon was like, okay, let's figure out how we're actually going to relax, <laughs> because it's just like it, when you really like to work so much, it's really hard to stop yourself because you're like, I have an idea, let's do this thing, and I think Russ and I are the same, where we would so much rather, you know, uh, take a night to devote to something that we're really, really like, oh my god, I suddenly had this crazy idea and it has to happen now, um, versus taking the time off to like you know, have a chill night in or something, which I do plenty of as well. But um, yeah, it can, it can be tough to, tough to stop. It's addictive. And I think part of it is when you have ideas, like I feel like I have a lot of harebrained ideas, but my harebrained ideas aren't so harebrained that they shouldn't be real. And I think um, that's the distinction that allows me to, to work a lot more and to create a lot more is that a lot of the ideas that I have tend to be on a smaller scale and are very helpful to a certain amount of people. So I really want to make them because I know that they'll be amazing and will help someone when, when they're made. Um, and I know that they'll take me a long weekend if I really just dive in. So I think that that's ma the main reason why I can, I can be so productive and work all the time is because I don't give myself like write an 800 page novel assignments. I give myself like spend eight hours doing this one thing assignments. And I think if you give yourself more realistic goals, you can be a lot more productive. And then after you feel like you can accomplish a lot, then you can give yourself bigger goals. Or if you're the kind of person that like needs to work on giant projects, then you know those are the kind of projects you should give yourself. I feel like you do just so many side projects. Do you feel like it's just a big mix of side projects or are there things that take your primary focus? There's, well, a lot of the side projects that I've done have been one-offs, which I kind of like those better because they don't require constant maintenance and constantly having to make new things for them because I do have a really short attention span when it comes to creation. Like I'll have an idea and I want it to be real and then it's real and then I'm happy and then I move on. But I have a couple projects that are long, longer term projects like Don't Fear the Internet, the, the video series that I made. And I love that project so much just because it I've gotten such amazing feedback from it and they're really enjoyable to make, and, and I feel like I learn a lot through making the videos too. Um, so I love putting them out there, but each video takes like 30 hours to make. Oh, wow. Just because we do, we write the full scripts in advance, and then we read through the scripts, and then we have to come up with images for it, and if you're coming up with images and slides for you know 15 minutes of a video, you know it's a lot to cut in. Mm -hmm. So we end up you know spending so much time on these videos that we release for free online and we have a little donate button but I think we've we definitely have not even gotten enough to cover like half of what the hosting costs <laughs> so so it's definitely a labor of love but it's it's still really worth doing because I feel like I get so much joy out of helping other people be able to do what they want to do and you know making these videos really you know getting those emails from people saying like, oh my God, I now can make my own portfolio website, la, and I'm just like, thank you, yay, go do it. And then that makes me motivated to go do my work because I know that there's other people that are getting motivated by things that I've made. That's really cool. I think, I think part of being a designer is editorializing your work. Mm -hmm. And with, with social media, there's this big temptation to just kind of post every step of everything that you're working on, but you don't do that. I've, I've, I've noticed that in your portfolio, you just post really complete work. Would you, would you say that's the case or? Um, I definitely don't abridge my portfolio much. So, um, and that's partially because of the illustration background. Really? Like okay. graphic designers can have a very minimal portfolio. You know, as a graphic designer, you want to show your 20 best pieces and show them very in-depthly, like, you know, case studies. Um, but as an illustrator, you need to show a lot of work 
especially if you want to work for the advertising field, just because, you know, a lot of times your clients are a little less, um, they can't look forward quite as much as, as other clients. So if they're hiring you to do something for a Christmas campaign and you don't have a Christmas tree in your portfolio, you'll get questions like, well, we just don't know if she can draw a Christmas tree. <laughs> and it's like, but I've drawn thousands of other trees. Look, I did this whole arboretum thing. It's like so many trees. But they need to see it in your portfolio because oftentimes the agency needs to be able to sell you to the client. And they need, like you might get contacted by an agency. It says, okay, send us all of your Christmas themed work, you know, which is pretty specific. And some people might only have one or two pieces um, but if you have it all online, it's really easy for them to grab. It's a lot easier for them to sell you through to the client. So that's why my portfolio is really, really big. And also because I really like pe pe like having students be able to go through and see the older work too. And and I don't. So there's very few pieces that I don't post in my portfolio. But there's of course some like some <laughs> bread and butter work that didn't make it on. Sure. <laughs> but yeah, in general, it's it's. I, li I like to share, but I also don't like to, I think that in general, whenever I post new work to my site, I don't go totally social networky crazy mm -hmm. talking about it online because I, like for me, I found that social networking has been like a really wonderful way for me to just talk to strangers every day and far <laughs> less of a way for me to be like, look at me, like look <laughs> at all these things, you know? Right. And I would never want it to steer towards the, the way of people thinking that I was using it as strictly a self-promotional tool. Mm -hmm. It has been, of course, wonderful in terms of promotion, but sure. I really, like, the thing that I enjoy most about Twitter and about any of those social networks is that I get to engage with people on, like, a real level and not be, like, a fake version of myself. So, and I think that people have responded to that, too, because, you know, I get so many emails from people that are having, like, life crises and want me to help solve them and stuff like that just because I am myself online. Like I'm not a very filtered person. One thing that fascinates me is how different designers decide to price their work. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I understand it, you don't price hourly, do you? No, no. And that's, that's just because most of the work that I do is not design. So I think if like design can make sense to p price hourly if you're working with a client in a long-term way, because, you know, and especially if you're not the best at pricing a project full out or you don't quite know the scope of the project yet. But with all the work that I'm doing, I know the exact scope of the project. And so it's all priced based on creation of work and then usage of the work. And that's just how illustration works. So lettering is, is within the illustration realm in terms of pricing for sure. So when a client comes to me and says, we have this assignment, you know, uh, what, do you, what do you price for it? There's a lot of factors that you take into consideration. It's like, who's the client? Because you're going to charge very differently for Coca-Cola than you are for like a cheese shop around the corner from your house, sure. you know? And then what kind of uses do they need? Do they need it to be domestic or international? Do they need web and print? Do they need it to be web, print, and media, like, bro like broadcast, like television stuff? And do they need it one year, two years, five years indefinitely? Do they want exclusive rights to your artwork? Or are you allowed to resell your artwork to other people after a certain time? And all that stuff kind of adds up to what the price ends up being. And what's really nice about pricing that way is instead of just having a flat fee of like, this is what it costs, you can break things down in a way that's, that they can be like, well, if you want it forever, all the artwork on every media, it's going to cost this. But if you just need it for two years, which of course, it looks like that's what you're only going to need it for, right. you know, it costs this. And if you only need it for two years, but you don't need it exclusive, it costs this. You know, so you can give them like little stepping stones along the way and they can figure out what usage that they want. So in the end, it allows me to price more fairly to smaller people and individuals and to be able to, um, you know, fund all of that kind of work and my side projects, which are totally for free and I make no money on essentially um, by pricing uh, standard to aggressively for, um, you know, the bigger kind of client work. Now, as you mentioned, you just had the opportunity to work with Wes Anderson on Moonrise Kingdom. Indeed. Can you talk about that experience? Must have been pretty cool. Sure, sure. <laughs> that was a ridiculous experience. And for one thing, since we're jumping from the pricing thing, whenever you work for cool people, mm -hmm. it's far less like of a 
bag of gold than when you work for dorky things that, sure. you know. So exactly. they, like, it was a great experience, but I definitely did not get paid in gold bricks for that project. Um, but working with them was crazy. I got an email from one of their co-producers um, that was just, like, super normal first client contact email. Hey, Jessica, this is Molly. I'm just one of the co-producers on Wes Anderson's new movie. And we're starting to think about the titles and we're wondering if you were around to do some tests for the titles. Thanks, you know, just like super normal contact right. email. And I was losing my mind <laughs> over it. I got it in. I like took a screen grab of it and sent it to <laughs> Russ. And then he calls me because he's freaking out. And, um, so, of course, I was like, yes, absolutely, yes, yes, yes. Um, and at the time, I wasn't sure if they were working with other people because a lot of times, as a letter illustrator, you're one among several people that they hire um, just to try things out and see who's the best and, and to sell through to the, to the end client. But I got the real impression that they weren't working with a lot of people at the point when they hired me. And then Molly, the, the woman that I worked with, verified it afterwards that they weren't, that they had tried to hire someone else but that they decided to not use them and then were sort of scrambling for a person and then came up with me and were like, okay, do it. <laughs> but they originally hired me to do um, a couple samples for them for a few hundred dollars just to like try, every, try out a few styles and see how we work together and things like that. And originally started based on Edwardian script, which is a pretty formal typeface. Um, and that was drawn by Ed Bangat, too, who's like an amazing legend. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of a tall order to draw something based on this crazy legend's time base. Um, but ultimately, we ended up steering away from that and going towards something that was a, a bit more hand-hewn feeling that was um, based on some film titles from, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the uh, the la the director's name, Chabrol or something like that. Um, okay. I'm terrible with French pronunciation. I and, understand. And uh, so we based it on some lettering that was in one of his films. And um, but then, of course, moved it in the direction of Wes's work, which is, of course, and my work is extremely American, too, so it's kind of hard to do anything that's European feeling. But, um, yeah, and then they originally hired me to do lettering for the front credits and a typeface for the end credits. Um, but ultimately, I ended up doing a typeface in two weights instead and then setting the, the front credits for them. And that was because once I had done the lettering, they were like, okay, great. Well, we need to pick a typeface to use on all the posters and stuff because obviously we can't use the, the text type that you made for the back on it. And you know, we're running out of time and we can't afford to, or, you know, we can't make another typeface. And I was like, no, I'll do it. Like, you know, <laughs> so essentially I ended up sort of doubling my work a little bit just because I really wanted them to be able to use it on everything that they wanted to. And it was so worth it because they used the typeface so extensively on all the posters and stuff that I saw around. And, you know, their original posters that they released was just like the type just all right. over the poster. Um, and it was awesome. And working with him was super amazing. Originally, when I first started the project, Molly um, was communicating Wes's direction to me through email. But when we really got into the thick of it, it was just Wes emailing me like doodles and stuff and occasionally writing in all caps by accident and <laughs> stuff like that. It was really fun. But he really knows his stuff and um, would give direction, like very, very specific direction for the type that most art directors wouldn't be able to give. You know, right. like he would make distinctions within like the lowercase r that I was making and wanted me to try something new and would suggest things that, you know, I've worked with a lot of art directors that have worked for years with type and have hired a lot of type designers and letters. And like the decisions that he made were more sort of like gut decisions because they weren't, you know, he didn't use the proper terms because he's not, this isn't his trade, it's not sure. his specialty, but they were so correct. Like all the decisions that he were making were correct and were right for the project. So it was really interesting to work together. It ended up being a major collaboration, like far more than me, like going off on my own and being this type expert. That's, that's amazing. Um, so wrapping up, for designers that are just starting out, what piece of advice would you give them? What do you feel like is the one thing that maybe you did for yourself that really put your career in motion? I think the biggest advice is to not be intimidated to start. You know, a lot of people 
see the, see they write their five year plan, you know, and then that five year plan just destroys them because it just seems so big and they don't see the steps along the way. And I think that the biggest thing that a lot of designers suffer from when they're starting out is like not being able to see the forest through the trees, you know. So I think the the biggest thing would be make small goals for yourself that are attainable, things that you love to do, um, and start there. And a lot of times that can really impact what you end up doing and like what you what you find that you really love. Because if you make a decision just based on a job title, you might not actually like what you're doing day to day. Um, whereas if you make a decision based on the things that you're actually, that you enjoy doing, like some people love tedium and some people hate tedium. Mm -hmm. So not everyone can be a type designer because so much of it is very, very tedious. And if you're not that kind of person, being a type designer sounds like it could be like a fun thing to do, but if you don't like the day to day, you would hate your job. Mm -hmm. Same thing with, you know, if you wanted to work at a branding agency, if you hate long-term brand extension projects, because you have a really short attention span and you love just being able to bang stuff out, then maybe you don't want to work there. So it's kind of doing, doing your homework and investigating um, you know, the work that goes into doing what you think you want to do and trying it out and deciding if it's right for you. Um, and a big way that I've sort of, and I've talked about this a couple times, but the big way that I figure it out is look at what you're doing when you're procrastinating from work, like the work that you're doing, not just what you're doing. If you find yourself um, focusing in on a really specific part of a project because you love doing that part of the project and hate doing all this part of the project, that's a sign. That, that can really help guide what you want to do in the future, you know, and really take time to step back and notice those things because that's essentially, that's how you guide your career without actually having to make a five-year plan. You know, you just do things based on how they feel and whether they're, whether you enjoy them and then you can make a, you can create your own career. It doesn't have to be a career that's even been established already. That's awesome. Well, Jessica, thanks so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, well, thanks for having me.